have six seats on the slide, and I'm happy to talk about all of them while we're here, or um, we can just pull up some commit terminals and work on stuff. Um, Ashik has already talked to me a little bit about some interesting collectives and, and day offs. I, I didn't put any day offs material together, all, all the examples I have, and hands on work is on Polaris and the Luster system. But I think some of the ideas might work out because he's curious about collective IO tuning and HDF5 and some of those things about there. Uh, we also have uh, over two doors down, Shane's talking about Darshan, uh, an IO characterization tool. And I have a, a few examples of how different things here interact with Darshan and how we can use that to help us understand uh, what's going on. Um, but uh, what brings you to this room in particular? What, what are you hoping to, to learn out of here? Go ahead, anybody. Uh, so we, like a major pipeline that we have uh, is, is basically a distributed inference uh, pipeline. So we have a model that we run in parallel and we produce like a lot of predictions and we basically write them to disk. Um, currently we just write individual HTML5 files. We end up with millions of them. And it's kind of been a pain to do like parallel write to them. And it's also like concerns about, you know, if there's like data corruption or something, like having everything stored in one place. Uh, yeah. yeah, these kinds of issues. So yeah, it's not really sustainable to have so many individual files, but also I'd like to know what's out there as alternatives to yeah. better strategies. So essentially we want to know how to the HDF5 writing coming from different levels of complications, like different cores or different nodes, doesn't yeah. matter. Um, and just have instead of having millions of files, millions of tiny HDF5 files, we want to have one big HDF5 file. Great. Yeah. Okay. We talk, talk about a lot of that. Good. Thanks for doing it. I was wondering what are you hoping to learn? And uh, we can skip over some stuff or go into more detail or less detail, depending on what's exciting to you. Uh, I want to learn some like profiling tools, like to profile the parallel file IO system, IO file. Good. Uh, although most of the profiling and performance analysis stuff would be at, at Shane's talk two doors down. So you can bounce back and forth or, or oh, catch recordings. And we have some because none of this stuff is useful without quantifying what's going on, but maybe also worth checking out that either uh, in live or, or the recording. Yeah, the, the, the doc Shane right? Two doors down, yeah, Shane. So um, we unfortunately have to compete for everyone's attention, even though I think there's a lot of overlap in interested parties here. And so, yeah, we're just talking about who's in the room and what they want to learn and which parts of this talk I should really drill into and which parts I should just gloss over and, and skip. I, at some point, need probably to improve my IO a bit. Um, I've tried HDF5 about a decade ago. It was functional, but none of my collaborators wanted to have anything to do with it. So it was like, well, it's more complicated than just write binary dump to a file. Um, the, the two big IO tasks that I have in my codes, and it's Fortran code, um, is at the beginning a read of a fairly large binary file. I think the typically of the, of the order of six gigabytes, it might go up to 15, maybe 20 gigabytes in, in the next five years. And all processors, all API works have to, to get it. At the moment, I do a read by one of them and a broadcast. And at the end of the run, roughly the square root of the number of MPI ranks write each part of a wave function to an individual file. So I get if I run on 10,000 nodes, uh, or sorry, 10,000 MPI ranks, 100 of them will write each to one file. Uh, 
probably of the order of a few gigabyte per file. All right, so if, you know, we were just talking about the, the challenges of dealing with multiple files, although you've got some larger files, you've got many smaller files. Um, I also have some smaller files, but they don't, don't tend to be the bottleneck compared yeah. to uh, And that's, that's a very pragmatic solution. Uh, uh, just chatting. Uh, because, right, it gets the job done, you can go to the next thing, and then somebody else's problem about how to manage all these different files and what's going on. But uh, it, it, for a lot of other reasons, sometimes taking that extra step to get a, a single larger file container or maybe a smaller number of handful of them um, can let us uh, have a little more confidence in the file's uh, resiliency, uh, uh, better performance because we, the, the libraries have a better view of what's going on. Um, let's talk about all that stuff. So, uh, performance wise, I know that the reading of the initial in large input file can be slow. Yeah. Well, there's not much we can do about that, but there's sometimes there should be a way to. I mean, it depends if everybody needs to know everything about the file, in which case there's only so much way you can get the data out. Or there's some other kind of decomposition you could. Everybody needs to know the whole file. In the latest version, I try to overlap it. I start to read fair, really as soon as I can. And I don't need everybody accessing the data until further down in the code. So I've, but I've not actually, I don't have a good feeling yet how, how that improves the total performance. But because I also changed, I mean, that was, I, I started out on ProMotor at NERSC, and of course, I haven't done much with the old version there, certainly not on the GPUs there. So not, not a lot of talk about GPUs in this talk. Uh, there is some, there was a question at the, at the um, earliest morning about how to, to, how to initiate the I.O. from GPUs. And there are some tools like uh, it's, it's called the GPU Direct for Storage from NVIDIA. I don't know if Intel has a similar or AMD has a similar um, tool. Uh, that's another one of those areas I should probably learn a little bit more about. But, and so there are so there's some work in that area, but most of this work is going to be in the classic sort of compute nodes doing stuff to storage. And the GPUs are going to accelerate things, but in the end, this, the CPUs are going to drive. Now, a question in that direction with MPI, you can do GPU or where MPI or whatever it's called, yeah. so that it goes directly from the GPU to the network, right? There's a little bit of that going on, yeah. yeah. So it, I would think naively if you do MPI IO, could it go directly from the GPU to the network to the disk or whatever your storage is? Uh, it a little bit of attention in the in the previous generations of machines here. The, the uh, well, the Theta machine, uh, the the accelerators were little Linux machines, and they acted like little smaller Linux uh, devices. They were they were KNL, nice landing, um, Xeon Phi accelerating nodes running on small Linux, but they were they were essentially compute nodes, and we treated them, treated them that way, and so. They're taught, they would talk to storage by going over the network and that would go well. On GPUs, I don't think they're quite as well connected to the network. Um, and so they usually have to they say, hop through the, the CPU. Um, and I, I don't think they're treated as separate compute entities. You, you dispatch threads to them and they, they turn away on their patches of, of, of thread work and then send the result back up to the, the caller. And so because it's a, a little different, uh, Dispatching model, I think it's harder to initiate I/O from there. Uh, although, like I said, there's a, that's an area that um, it's, it's changing pretty fast, so that might be the case soon. Um, but this is great. Uh, I'm happy to talk about all this stuff. Uh, whatever. So this is kind of conversation is, is wonderful. I don't have to plow through all these slides, but I, do, I, I was told I should introduce myself a little bit. You've all told me about your interest. Uh, I'm. I'm Rob Latham. I've been at Argon for a while, since 2002, working on, on parallel libraries, parallel file systems, and, and helping applications use these libraries and tools to go, go faster. Uh, I like to say that every application has an I.O. problem, even if they don't really know it yet, because at some point you've made the CPU go so fast that, well, we saw it again the chart this morning, the, the, battle, the bottlenecks, the, sorry, the, the scale between what the compute can do and what the storage can do is just getting bigger. And bigger. And so uh, libraries like 
uh, MPIO and libraries on top of MPIO can help us use those uh, more efficiently. Um, and we, you know, we're all hopefully probably everyone's familiar with, with MPI. And so if you don't have an MPI type problem, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is going to be um, harder to apply. Machine learning and, and inference models are a different kind of program model than classic uh, simulation IO model that we that I, that I kind of grew up working to optimize, but the same concepts still apply. The ideas of uh, if we could tell the storage system who's going to work on this and how it's going to happen and what kind of patterns we're going to do, we might have a chance to uh, optimize that better. And so, uh, right, start out with, uh, I'll just jump right in here to MPIO. Uh, if you're familiar with simple POSIX IO, it, it, you, can, you can do simple MPIO, almost a one to one mapping. Uh, and it might, be, it might seem weird to have a IO chapter of a message passing library, but if you think about sending a message to a process, it's not so different from writing to a file. You you have collectives and data types and all the other MPI type machinery. It can still be used to optimize the storage down to the file system. And reading from a file is a lot like receiving a message from a neighbor. Uh, and and some of the things that make MPI's collectives and MPI's data types so useful in the message passing context uh, also work really well in the MPIO context. Now, also I'm going to spend a little time talking about MPIO because libraries like Parallel CDF and HDF5, uh, uh, they, well, they, they have some functionality at their levels. The IO part all happens through MPIO. So just like maybe we don't write MPI code directly, it could be part of a, a AMR library or wrapped up in some other kind of interface, the IO story is the same way. But you could write directly to the MPIO interface and, and use the MPIO libraries, but uh, we are mostly going to be dealing with higher level abstractions um, when, when we write code, but it helps to understand what's going on with the non-contiguous I optimizations, collective I optimizations, uh, as we uh, use these higher level abstractions. So it's uh, a hands-on talk. I wasn't sure how much hands-on we were going to do if we we're going to, you know, Check out some code on GitHub and, and write things on our uh, submit to our that the queue that I really talked about. But if you do want to start off, uh, sorry, we got a whole bunch of. <clears throat> so uh, you checked out this repository earlier in the workshop. Uh, all of my stuff just got uploaded this uh, this morning because that's the way we, we do things, right? We, we do our presentations at the last minute or go to the last just minute. in time, just in time. <laughs> so. Uh, fresh up, refresh your, your GitHub check out and you'll find a um, in the visualization and IO and MPIO HDF5 directory you'll find uh, some some other directories uh, with information that'll help you that, that should have some of these uh, some of these code examples that I've taken excerpts for from and put on the screen but we can uh, also uh, work with them directly and send them off to the queue so if you're going to write a little I don't get it. Uh, okay, good. If you were into so simplest, we, we, we always start out with any language or computer science concept is hello world. And in this case, uh, you can think of a, a parallel hello world. We, we, we write out strings to a file. And uh, there are a couple of things I'd like to point out in this slide. We have the notion of a, a communicator where once everybody's, where the library, sorry, the MPIO library, now knows that all the processes in the COM world are going to be part of this. And there's also a, a tuning parameter here, the info object. We'll talk about that in a few slides. <clears throat> I also want to point out that not everybody's writing the same amount of data. The, the string can have a variable length, uh, be a you know, one digit number or 10 digit number, or it's a lot of processes, but uh, you don't have to know exactly, you don't have to commit to a fixed amount of data. You can have variable amounts or no data at all. And then a collective. Right, all the collective calls end in underscore all. Uh, about the challenges of doing collective I.O. versus independent I.O. Uh, I like to start off with a collective approach. We can always turn it off with hint objects. You can tell the library, hey, I don't ever do the collective optimizations for this. But collectives have certain rules, right? Everyone has to participate in the collective and NPI assumes that everyone's gonna be here about the same time. So if you have, a fixed amount of work per process, 
and you enter the collective I.O. call about the same time, hey, great. But if you have something that's a little more imbalanced or lumpy and you don't hit this collective at the same time, it could, it could, you can see a worse performance than you might expect. So a couple of things to think about. All right, so we can describe with this, uh, this offset pattern value that I file right at all, uh, where to go in the file, and then here we go, everyone can write their own data. For this simple example, it's just, just strings. So if you run it, you'll get a cooking show. Uh, we've got a, a JavaScript, which if you've been at this workshop for your third day now, you've probably done a lot of these, but from the, first, from the standpoint of MPIO, what's the source point out here? Um, yeah, there's a there's the Eagle directory. There's a fall workshop directory under there, and you can make your own directory for that. Uh, we'll talk about striping parameters on these directories, but the default striping here is going to be one on Polaris, which is often going to be bad. We'll talk more about that as well. Um, other than that, it's just like a regular MPI program that you run on Polaris. And when you look at the output, you know, everyone's, everyone has stored their own information in their own part of the file. And there's a lot of details here you've got to keep track of. You know, what, what does it mean to have, if we got to know about, we got to know about offsets, we have to know about who's done what, computing everything. At higher levels, like MPI IO, sorry, at higher levels on top of MPI IO, like HDF5, that's the, that, those concepts, bytes in a file and file views and all this stuff. It's all going to be presented to you in terms of arrays and, and counts of elements. But right now, at this level, it's going to be more bytes or numbers of integers, something like that. So uh, there is this notion of a, of a shared file pointer routine. So in this case, right, we had to figure out where everybody was going to write. And we, we just made sure that the first rank wrote at the beginning and the last rank wrote at the end. And the MPIO library also prov provides uh, shared file pointers, so ordered mode file pointers, which the library keeps track of where people have written. But that that keeping track piece is a pretty heavyweight operation. So performance for these shared file pointers is, is quite poor. And I've never seen anybody use them in practice. And as a result, the library doesn't uh, really work at making them better. So uh, doing a little bit of this legwork on your own is probably the best way to get so, so, sorry, so e each of these, yeah, sure. you, you told them that you should write your output at the n, n minus one line of this output file. Is that right? I got the line. Uh, we keep the, the length of each. It's not the line. It's, 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 a, it's all stored in a, it's a POSIX file. So it's a linear stream of bytes. Yeah. And everyone has to know which offset to write to. So there's a, there's a new line in this file. We know it's 24 or 25 bytes long or 26 bytes long, depending on how many processes we have. And this X scan routine is a MPI routine is an exclusive sum in this case, sum. So uh, rank zero just starts off as zero and then adds the, everybody contributes their length to this final value offset. It's, it's one byte here. Oh, sorry, it's one value, one 64-bit uh, value. It's all, uh, yeah, yeah, it's gonna be, uh, the input is the output, uh, length is the input. Of, and so everyone knows has now done some computing ahead of time to know where to write without stepping on each other's toes. If we didn't do this extra work, it would be um, a, a jumble, either at best a jumble. It's not, um, it's gonna, it'll be, you just get a bunch of messes. So, so right, that, it, while it looks like it's one line per process, it's really what it is, is there's a line in that string. So when you dump it out, it looks like um, more, a more structured file than it actually is. And it would have looked like this regardless of which one finished first or second. Oh, yeah, exactly. We, 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 exactly. we could time this somehow. We could somehow see how this showed up in the file. That would be kind of a fun visualization. But right, could very well have been um, at the end here that, well, sorry, let me just step back a little bit. Because this is a collective call, uh, because it is using MPI file, right? All the library is actually doing some stuff here to uh, jumble things around. And it's probably. Uh, probably actually send all this data to one rank to do the IO for you in practice, given how big, the, how small the data is relative to the, the native block size of the Lustre file system. Uh, but we'll talk some more about some of those collective optimizations that happen uh, in the library. And yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, some there is there could very well have been uh, out of order writes here 
um, or maybe even partial rights. Depending on, um, you can imagine, um, it's a, not <laughs> I just want to say, oh yeah, yeah. The other thing I do here in this example is uh, I've wrapped all the MPI calls with this MPI check macro. It's just a, it checks the return type and, and then it prints out the MPI error code for what happens if you do things badly. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a dumb C code. So if you don't check your error codes, you will try to open the file. And if the file doesn't exist, you just go on to the next step and write data to it empty file handle, and then you'll wonder where your data went, which has unfortunately happened to me more times than I care to admit. So I now I just check the error codes all the time. In, in, in some of the other wrappers like Python or HDFI, the error codes are more uh, hard to ignore. So that's um, something to think about in this case. Um, Did you regard that uh, MPI check yourself? Or? Yes, yeah. Um, if, 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 you know, as, as I mentioned, yeah. there's a the, 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 this hands-on workshop code has, has the full code examples, and um, you can and you can take a look at the, the simple little macro, just a few lines long. Are these slides on Slack? You know what? I put them to box, but I didn't put them in the uh, the mod sharing for a second while I get that Slack for you. The workshops. No help there. Uh, yeah, give me a second here. Sorry. Here we go. Oh, look at that. Everyone's here. I did not hear. Great. And add a file. And this channel on Slack, is it called IO? I'm sorry. Uh, HDF5 and MPI IO. Supposed to be a slide channel too. I should put it in. Uh, give me a second. Find that too. Oh, yep, saving that lot. And we go back to new channel. All right, thanks. Yeah, I should have done it. Uh, so I think you'll find uh, full code examples, full work examples, and the job submission scripts, and maybe even a few post processing scripts in the, uh, in the repository. And I can help, I'm happy to talk more about that. Yeah, so, so we go right now. It's about yeah, we have some more time. I want to show a couple more things about MPIO before we get into the MPIO five thing. So uh, of course we do we do more than just write simple strings out to the file. We usually write large amounts of binary data or various structures. And so uh, while I don't often run the science codes to see how good is the file system or the storage system, I do make heavy use of synthetic benchmarks like this IOR benchmark and. Uh, uh, there's been a couple of different, there, there, there are a few other options out there, but IOR has, has proven itself to be pretty flexible in terms of uh, the, the size of the IO you write, how interleaved the IO might be, or how non contiguous the IO might work out to be, whether or not you're using collectives. And there's lots of easy ways to pass parameters through uh, tuning parameters and change different uh, strategies or compare different backends. Right? IOR has got a, a POSIX backend, a MPIO, also parallel NCDF, MPI, uh, HDF5. Uh, Chaos and, and Amazon S3. And so you can compare how these different uh, interfaces would be. You could sort of mimic your, if you understand your, if you, if you know what kind of workload you're trying to test out, small, many small operations, very large, big operations, the effects of buttons. And IOR is not a bad choice here. So there's a couple concepts. The idea of a, a segment, right? There's going to be a, a chunk of the, of the file, a logical chunk of the file that everyone's going to um, work with. So, and then uh, there's, there's, I always give the block factor and the transfer factor mixed up, but uh, apparently yeah, the transfer size is, is how how many times you're going to transfer the data for each block. Uh, if you try to run IOR, you, you do a bigger transfer size than block size, it'll carpet you and then you'll wonder what happened and you know, flip those parameters around. 
And so uh, for a for a typical folk parallel write or parallel reader, you would just say, hey, I want everyone to write a block of data, each process, each rank. There will be one segment and each process can write out a rank and there'd be 64. So each rank write out a block and there'd be you know, a thousand or 2000 of these blocks. And then you talk about the, uh, the bandwidth for sort of an, an ideal large transfer to the file system. Almost all these parallel file systems that are deployed are, are designed for this kind of workload. Uh, part of the trick of the MPIO library is to turn little itty bitty small writes and, and, and reads into the big transfers that make sense for file systems. Oh, yeah. So in your first program, the, the write all, yeah. so if I compare with that, like uh, the, the buffers there, is it like a transfer size or is it a block size here? Uh, yeah, so uh, I would say each each transfer size in this schematic would confirm would correspond to one MPI call or one POSIX call or one IO operation. And so each process in order to transfer, I don't know, a gigabyte of data might do that in four 256 megabyte chunks. Or they might do it in one big chunk. It could depend, it depends on how you'd like to um, mimic. So, you, so for example, uh, you might consider a a HDF5 data set with, with where each block is a variable and each transfer size might be a column of the data of the variable. So, or you know, you can think of something like that, for example. Although the, the mapping is a little bit harder to, um, it's, it's not such a direct mapping in HDF5, but it's sort of an analogous that you might have some workload where everyone's going to write the first piece of the transfer size. So, so plot into the transfer size zero, 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 and then they go through, and then the next iteration they write the second piece. That can be actually a fairly so that's that's a good example of. It looks like it's contiguous, but it's actually non-contiguous in in the the, the global scope. I'll, I'll get to that one a little bit. Um, but yeah, so back the real question was, um, in the end, uh, every transfer size is an I/O operation. And that's sort of the fundamental atomic operation in, in IOR. So yeah, you can build up from there. You're thinking of each time you do a transfer size, you're, you're doing something to storage the, the back end, whether it's POSIX, FPIO, or HDF5, or whatever else they cover. So a simple uh, IOR benchmark would look like this. If you pulled it out of your, um, you look, so you look at some of these run strips, uh, it's a simple, IOR benchmark where we are uh, using the MPIO interface with the, with the, the a, the API, which which back in. And I often will run it a few times to get some better sense of what's the actual value. Uh, writing to, to storage is a noisy operation because it's not a dedicated resource. There's other users. Uh, the file system has, has is a physical often it's physical spinning disk. So you've got fast nodes and or fast storage nodes and or slower nodes, or, or maybe a RAID is being rebuilt or degraded for some reason. So there's a lot of things that can make the back here. If I was going to measure the L1 cache speed of my CPU, I would just run a tight arithmetic loop and I could figure it out pretty fast. And if I ran it a hundred times, that would be a really tight, I'd always get the answer within very, very small epsilon each run. That's not the case for storage. You'll we'll find uh, some pretty significant error bars in storage. And, and the only way that we can really deal with that is multiple runs, sometimes you get multiple times a day to sort of understand uh, and try to infer the, the, what the, the true storage value, uh, sorry, true performance value compared to what's actually happening in this uh, noisy environment. All right, so let's move this here. Oh yeah, um, other things here that are important around here I've got, a bunch of one megabyte transfers. I just want to make sure uh, we're getting lots of iterations to the file system to measure the performance. So rank zero is going to write a bunch of data at the first part, and then rank two, and, and so on and so forth. And in the bigger JavaScript for this, I wanted to see the effect of luster stripe size on performance. As I mentioned, when we, oh yeah, there's this, this I like this graph. So I should mention uh, this a little bit sooner. When we are measuring performance, uh, 
when the machine is first installed, there's no storage uh, often. Usually you just get the, the, the rack of CPUs and then the storage comes along later. Uh, and even if it does come along later, you're still in acceptance testing. There's no users to use the file system. This is the only real part of the time in the machine's life when you'll have dedicated access to the storage. Uh, they let folks from ALCF do that to, to verify things. Uh, I, a researcher like me, uh, don't get it until somewhere in this area, maybe friendly users when the, the contention curve is getting higher and higher, which is uh, less fun for me, but it, 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 um, it's understandable, right? The, it's a job that machines are not built for IO researchers are built for uh, physical phenomenon and material science and astrophysics and that kind of stuff. So eventually the machine gets old and tired and it's almost retiring and users aren't using it anymore. And you might get one last chance to play with the file system. But at this point, the machine is, as we talked about earlier, five or six years old. And if I find out that there's some fun feature of this five-year-old file system, it's not very interesting anymore. But uh, it is helpful to see if your software scales to you know, a five-year-old machine, I suppose. But uh, what I mean, what I'm, all I mean to say is, when we're doing benchmarking and we're doing IO evaluations, we have to consider that these machines are uh, contended, and we won't be able to say for sure if uh, this bad result is because it's uh, someone's doing a checkpoint at the exact same time, or there's some maintenance going on. Uh, so there's a little bit of a trickery there. Okay, so stripe size. So uh, all of our, if you just Make a directory on Luster and you start running this benchmark. You're going to be living down here in this one stripe regime, a few megabytes per second. And you hear about this file system that's got a gigabyte per second bandwidth. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I can't remember what the last uh, number I heard from, from, from uh, Polaris's uh, grand and eagle file systems were. Uh, but here, for looking for writing here, this is a small number of nodes and we increase the strike count. And if we start using tens or hundreds of, of, of Luster servers, we're getting pretty good performance here. We're getting you know, a thousand times better performance. So uh, I would hate to see anybody using the default stripe size. So Shane mentioned progressive file layout and the effective striping size, but I want to reiterate that um, it's easy to fall into that trap and then, and then wonder why I'm getting really bad performance. Uh, so I, first thing I always do is I use this tool called LFS set stripe. It's a luster utility and uh, negative one is saying use all the luster servers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very informal. Uh, so how many computer nodes should I have to use this AD stripe code OSDs? Like if I do just one computer node, if I'm running 32 process and if I'm using 80 stripe code, it's not useful. So I don't think it's useful, as you mentioned, because there's only one network link between your compute, compute node and the storage. The storage is always some separate utility off away from the compute. You know, there's some storage, some rack of storage and the racks of compute, and you've got to go off, off storage. But I don't think it hurts anything either. Uh, you don't see this curve going down at any point, maybe a little bit of Maybe the highest point you can maybe think about a small, the slope here isn't, isn't perfectly going up or flat. There is a little detour here, but the, the benefits to striping are so high that I can't imagine any scenario where I want anything less than all of the uh, available OSTs. Uh, no, I mean, for this plot, when you're using just one computer node, and then you are increasing all the stripe counts, or by using many computer nodes, and then you are increasing the stripe. Right. Let me think here. This is. Um, how many computer nodes was this? Um, I didn't write that, did I? I don't know, 128 nodes. Um, so this is a fairly, this, I mean, this is a modest number of compute, of compute nodes uh, on this system, but if you only had a, and so, right, so 128 compute nodes, uh, one OST per compute node is somewhere around this region of the, of the graph. And so um, your intuition might be like, well, okay, that one node doing cache should have one OST or one, parallel, one level of parallelism. But then, uh, you can only set the parallelism at file creation time. And uh, if you're going to increase the parallelism because you're going to uh, create the file in one process and read it back on a thousand processes, uh, you'd need to copy the file or do something with that file to um, restripe it across more OSTs. Uh, so I would, again, so it's usually my... Um, 
I, I do a lot of scaling studies. I, I take an app and then I increase right. from one node to six to one node. Okay. So as I increase the number of compute nodes, should I proportionally increase the strike count or should I set the same strike count irrespective of the number of uh, compute nodes that I use? I mean, I, should, I would say that, that it might, there's, there's probably one of those 3D plots with curves and valleys and mountains where there's an ideal region for every combination of stripe counts and compute nodes. And I haven't really got a good mental model for that one yet. I just stick with the, just widely stripe every file all the time, always. And uh, there, um, and, yeah, you, and your intuition is, is, is right, that there probably is an ideal uh, that a small number of compute nodes would probably benefit from a small number of, of striping, small amount of striping. But uh, again, I think because of the, uh, I mean, but uh, everybody does a scaling project. You would have done a lot of scaling studies. So when you are doing, do you set the same stripe on and stripe size for all the nodes? Yeah, I always use every single OST. Uh, I always, I just never change from that. And unless, unless I make a big deal about a report, I'll always be discussing a wide stripe. If, if you say that's kind of your default, why is that not the machine default? One, I wish I knew, but two, okay, so the short answer is, uh, yeah. But the longer answer is that if you look at the distribution of work of, of files on a file system, even a parallel file system like Lustre, is the classic Pareto distribution where 80 or 90% of the files are quite small and only gonna be touching one server at a time. But 90% of the data is a few enormous files that should be used striped across every single OST. And so uh, as you stripe across more servers, you are exposing yourself to uh, uh, that slow server that's, that's out to lunch, doesn't respond to you in time, uh, or a server that's being degraded somehow, or six processes are all hitting that same OST at the same time, the same luster server at the same time. And so I think uh, for a lot of pragmatic reasons, uh, scientists will often just stick with a, a single stripe and many, many files, per pro one file per process to, uh, to get that better performance without really worrying too much about it. Now, as you scale up, you're definitely you're left with lots and lots of files, which can be its own management problem. Now, for, for the input, I usually, I have just one, one processor reading it and then a broadcast. I think that's great. Uh, I, don't, I, mean, I think you mentioned your input file is a several gigabytes large, which can be a little bit. Which well, be, I, I have kind of, different different types of input files. One of them is that big file, yeah. and then that's where I think I need to do something more clever moving forward. Um, but but I also have have input files that are ten twenty ASCII files. But, but that's just yeah, one. So thing. definitely uh, the the machinery of collective I/O. Oh, this is now an old story from two generations ago, but there were cases where reading in a small input file blew up the memory on these machines, sort of consumed all the memory on the machines. And the, the, the right response was to, to do the read and broadcast or to try to teach uh, MPIO or HDF5. Well, how to we did the read and broadcast because at some point we had every single, pro initially we had after every single MPI rank open and read the file. And this was written by the person who developed the code before yeah. me. It was not even opened in read-only mode. Yeah. So that would cause a bit of a disaster. Right, you got every process reading a giant file. So there's lots of extra redundant data traffic. Sure. Um, uh, and, and the networks now are much better than the storage system. So yeah, I think um, I can imagine cases where you want to maybe have a broad, you maybe want to read from Few processes and broadcast. Few processes and then a broadcast on the subset. But uh, yeah, something like that, or MPI read on a few. The first order, a single process read and broadcast should should a single process reading and broadcasting to everybody should work for quite a few cases, and then talk about the more challenging cases uh, as we need to. Yeah. Um, so right, if you're going to run this experiment again, uh, I/O benchmarking is a is a kind of like bailing out a, a leaky boat. Uh, I'll get some numbers from one point in time, but then 
if I were to run this again, this is a February, this, is a, this curve is from February. And it, it didn't curve from one run or an average of a? Yeah, there's a small number of uh, error bars here. So um, if we go back here, the iterations per, there's a, there's a few iterations per process. Oh, like oh, a, yeah. Five iterations per process. So it's, it is one run in time with multiple iterations to see if we can sort of nail down these uh, bars. And I'm plotting, the, I'm plotting the average, but also showing the, the range of what values that we yeah. got. So for example, over here, the big reader, yeah, we got a pretty wide range of the first or second reads. One of, one of the reads was really, really bad and most of them are pretty good. So the average is pretty high, but there is this one data point here I can't ignore. Um, I can talk a little bit more about outlying data points and how we- If, if one of them is not responsive, it's slow. Yeah, so yeah, I don't, I don't know exactly what happened at this, that particular data point. Um, the other thing is uh, there are some, right? So this, I would expect this, this graph is what eyeball it. peaks out at 40 gigabytes a second. The Polaris file system is advertised, the, the Eagle file system is advertised as being probably twice that. And um, I would like to study a little bit more about why it's not higher. And some of that is uh, lock contention in Luster. There's no way to tell Luster Really, no way to tell Esther. Hey, look, I'm a parallel process. I'm a parallel, parallel program. Just get out of my way and let me write data to you. Because Luster is trying to well, the detour here. There's this uh, there's, a, there's a facility in these file systems that is trying to serialize concurrent access so that no one steps on each other's toes, or if they do, uh, there's this rule in POSIX called the the sequential consistency. The last person to touch a file has to win. That, that so there's no race condition in, in the POSIX file system. Um, just whoever last wins. And so file systems to implement that semantic have to detect concurrency and which Luster does with extent based locking. And then when a process comes through and wants to write or update a piece then the lock is revoked to be a smaller region, that other process gets control of the new region and that's updated and that, that, that lock traffic can be uh, kind of expensive. And it's hard to monitor that without a little more um, detail about what's going on in the, in the back end. So something we kind of have to observe from um, empirical, as, as users have to observe by, by seeing the results and trying to understand why they are the way they are. Uh, but I would say that the, the, the big answer here is just, um, again, how almost always the, the higher trip count is, is the best. And, and we can talk about specific situations where it's not, but I think that's a pretty small area. Um, but that's great, right? We don't always write continuous chunks of data out the file. Sometimes we can, but in scientific data, there's uh, Hilbert curves trying to map parts of the uh, atmosphere uh, in, in, in interesting ways computationally, or there's uh, uh, particle tracking code and, and particles move around in, in space and, and, and they're lumpy in some areas and sparse in other areas. And so the data will often be highly uh, non-uniform or, or structured in some way. And so the big challenge for some of these simple examples in a talk like this is how do I convey the decomposition problem? Uh, if you can tell each process where the, what data the writing is or reading, then you're almost halfway done with the, the challenge of parallel IO. Uh, and then you, but then you also have a, a choice of how you, as a storage system, uh, represent this, this structured data. Do you try to map the in-memory representation by writing exactly as the application expects it? Or do you do something maybe more log-oriented perhaps or, or journaling so you can write out very, very efficiently to the file system? And if you were to use something, there's a, there's a couple of libraries out here on top of all these file systems. Uh, you may have heard of Audios. Uh, Oak Ridge has some people and developers on the Audios project that are pretty big on that. And they will work pretty hard to write the data as fast as possible in their their audio is file format. And then the reading back problem is somebody else's problem. And often that's fine because like I said, this is simulation IO where we're checkpointing quite a few times. And if we do read the data back, we're often reading back the data in the way we wrote it. But there are cases where uh, that, that log structure uh, output is not ideal for downstream consumers. So uh, the question of how do we write out the data depends a lot on how we're going to consume the data. Maybe not you, but how your collaborators are going to consume the data. And some of the approaches that are fast for writes are, are slow for reads and, and, and vice versa. 
But uh, this is a, just a way to segue into non contiguous IO and some of the structured IO uh, and the ways that the MPIL library can, can deal with that, transform those, those data into ways that make sense for the file system. Right, so you can imagine a, uh, in this case, this is the, this is the flash after physics code. They have, they have nearest neighbor exchanges, and so they keep ghost cells around. And we don't want the ghost cells. They're just actually there for as a computational or as a communication optimization, but they're not significant data. So when we write the data out, we have to skip these ghost cells. And so you end up with kind of data with holes in it. And okay, that's fine. Uh, in, a, in a global sense, it's not a very terrible um, access pattern, but each process was kind of sparse and, and structured. Um, and, and so the IO library, in this case, MPIO, uh, is going to be doing these, these transformations. So while the user will describe the data in some way that's natural to the user, a column of data or a sparse matrix or whatever makes sense, uh, maybe there's something that happens in the MPIO library that writes the data out in a different way. And, and, and that transformation, uh, we call it a transparent transformation, because even though the data may be written out in a certain structure, maybe, you know, even though this is like it's logically contiguous in each process, the IO library scattered it throughout the file. Uh, the user reading this back, the, the structure will be, it'll be as if it was written the way the user expected it. And the uh, optimizations happen behind the scenes. You don't, uh, so, you, so this is more of the, this is more of a case, uh, if you call this case, case A, where you're writing out journal data, or case B, where you're writing out structured data, or sorry, writing out data in the structure of the calling application or the applications community. This would be more of a, uh, a case B uh, situation where there's some, some transformation that happens, and, and then later, your other consumers of the data don't have to worry about how the data was written. It looks like um, the way a serial code would have written it. The other reason we do these, these transformations is because there are some file system specific quirks that we hope applications don't need to worry about. Uh, this is a, a previous generation machine, Theta. Right into a previous generation of a Lustre file system. I, I did an IOR benchmark that wrote out in various request sizes, those transfer sizes we talked about, ranging from pretty small to fairly large, and sometimes power of two, of 1024 or 8192, sometimes power of 10, if you're like 8,000 or 2,000 or 1,000. And so you see this subtle tooth pattern because the best performance, uh, those kind of high error bars here, when you get to this, this 1024 kilobytes, the, the one binary megabyte of uh, natural stripe size of the Lustre file system. And if you deviate from that a little bit, you fall off a cliff and get very poor performance, almost a factor of, in this case, factor of three or four worse performance. And I would hate for applications to have to memorize that this particular magic value is the best place to get performance. Instead, the IO library on, on Polaris and, and all these machines, it sort of know. I write the Lustre, I'm going I'm to query the Lustre file system, and I'll try to transform requests to write to that size. This is uh, pretty important in Lustre. It's very important in older systems like GPFS, where the curve was more hockey stick like, where you had very, 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 very bad performance, and then it shot up to the best performance of 16 megabytes. But even so, there is still some of this. Uh, there's an affinity here, and if you were to, you can, I encourage you to try this out on any file system you have access to. Uh, you don't need very many nodes to demonstrate this behavior. You, you can do this on, uh, in this case, it was, well, in this case, it was, it was, it was like uh, 64 processes, but you could do it on a small number and still see this kind of behavior. So if we're going to try to hit all of our requests in this, in this sweet spot, we can do a couple of things. There's something called data seeding in the MPIO library. Uh, it turns out today, data saving isn't the greatest option, as you can imagine. Um, so this might be, you might be, if you're familiar with uh, RAID devices or SSDs, there's a, a read, modify, write step. You update partial pages or partial blocks in those technologies. And I, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe Romeo or, uh, predates those technologies, but uh, we call it data saving, which is the same idea. There's a sieve of data, or you, you read in a bunch of contiguous data into memory. You update the blocks that you're updating. Instead of writing out each one of these pieces individually, uh, piece by piece, you, you update a, a big block of data and then write it out in a large chunk. 
And that can be a win because each of these writes and reads from the file system goes out over a network, has latency. And so you can imagine a, a performance curve that at some point, um, this, is, this is a win and at some point it's, it's not a win anymore. And I think we, if you're, uh, pretty easy as we'll see in the following graphs to, to fall in the not a win situation because you are moving a lot of extra data here in this case. But uh, you can also picture, as, you, as we saw, and in the previous graph, uh, if you are if your data sort of is naturally 64 bytes, you're going to get very poor performance, and so you might try to scale up these intermediate blocks to be larger and, and more bus friendly. You think not a win because you have to allocate it's a buffer. Yeah, it's it's a memory it's memory intensive. It's uh, uh, time intensive because the reads take non-zero amount of time, and then also if you have simultaneous writes to these regions. This, this is the big loss in this one. Uh, same process, this, this, this process here is writing out the green blocks, but someone comes along and wants to write out the, the yellow blocks, the cream, the, the non green blocks. There has to be someone has to, something has to mitigate this so that only one of these wins. And so in the MPIO library, there is a pretty heavy lock serialization around this step. So concurrent accesses and updates to these blocks is highly serialized. And uh, I would say, that that lock and serialization part is um, for writes is the biggest factor in poor performance, more so than the extra reads. Although that's a factor as well. And uh, if you were to look at um, a simple IOR uh, benchmark to demonstrate this, you can use this. Uh, the, the you can relatively recent versions of, of IOR will construct an MPI data type. MPI data types are how we Describe the non contiguous data. And in this case, the purple process is going to write uh, a kind of a sparse vector out to the, to the uh, file, while the uh, gold process writes another sparse vector out to uh, the empty parts of that, of that data. And you can imagine you had uh, another process here filling in the white blocks, right? You'd have concurrent, concurrent non contiguous IO writing out to these files. And um, before we talk about uh, this is a little detour to Darshan, uh, it's helpful to see what's going on under the hood with this tool. Uh, so we're, we're up here at the application level. In this case, we're writing an IOR benchmark. I'm sorry, an MPIO benchmark. So we're not too far. The, the file system and then a runtime library, right? Maybe an MPIO library here. But this stack can get pretty deep. And we've often had the case of an application writer saying I'm, I'm doing X or Y, and then uh, turns out they're not because they don't, they don't really know, and they shouldn't know uh, all the different abstraction layers, what's going on. And so we wrote a tool called Darshan that fits in here and uh, records out into a Darshan log all the different characteristics of, of, of the different uh, libraries. Uh, we also have a newer pieces like, like Deos in here too, but uh, it's, it's not a, a trace library. We're not capturing every single operation because that would be uh, too much overhead. But instead, in Darshan, we're capturing statistics about what happens, or histograms of what happens, or counters, or timers, things that are uh, fixed in memory. And uh, it's kind of stay out of the way of these operations. And so uh, we have uh, a format here that sort of keeps keep, keep the pending different. Uh, this is a module or a log format. So if you were really interested about writing about, um, so Shane wants to add some Deos features here. So we're going to write a new module that, that just adds more information to the Darshan log about what's going on. That detects the use of Deos and then adds it on. Okay. Uh, we wrote this in an MPI context, but there is some features for non MPI users. Uh, I would suggest you check out, um, first, you check out the, the ALCF documentation about Darshan or Shane's talk two doors down or the slides when they go online to this workshop. And uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna have a lot of Darshan data to talk about uh, how that works. Uh, so uh, data seeding, right? So I'm, uh, this, uh, this table is, is Darshan data, but I wanna first draw attention to uh, naive is, is the, the piece by piece way of writing out that non contiguous pattern and uh, bandwidth is, you know, uh, one one thousandth of the archived bandwidth of this file system, 600 megabytes a second. 
data CV made it much worse, and probably because it was uh, moving, uh, gosh, a hundred times more data than needed. There's some right some right amplification happening here, for sure. We should probably update that intermediate buffer to better match the workload if we were trying to really optimize that. Uh, but you can see here, 192 MPIO writes. This is um. Uh, Okay, uh, so, uh, a modest number of processes writing this out, but uh, those those writes turn into uh, so with the naive case turned into a bunch of POSIX writes, um, and, and really important data here. Important part here is, is the factor of a hundred increase in, in data and bytes moved in the data saving case. So we're throwing away a lot of data. Uh, there's also a fun way to visualize this Darshan data. I, I did mention that Darshan is. Statistics oriented and, and, and sampling oriented, not sampling oriented, but trying to characterize the IO. But it does have a mode where you can trace the IO operation by operation. And then you can feed it to a tool like a DXT Explorer, which will give you a timeline view of what's happening here. You can zoom in, and, and uh, in this case, uh, there's a mixture of, so sorry, blue is, is brights and reds are reads. So, Here's a, a very slow MPI IO operation, one single operation per line. And then that turns into a bunch of, it's hard to see if you're anywhere near, if you download the slide, you can zoom in here and look at it, but you can see lots of little operations, mixtures of reads and writes, but a lot of blank space too. As you mentioned, when you're doing data saving, uh, the, the library, it's, sorry, data saving is an independent operation. It doesn't know how many people are participating in this operation. So it has to be conservative about concurrent updates. It has to lock the file and serialize access. And so you have cases where here's a, a, a very long read trying to happen, but it, it, it's, it's a pain to lock trying to read the file, but it has to wait for, I'm sorry, it's requested the lock. Sorry, requested the lock. And other processes are trying to finish up their operation before it can finish its read and then do a write of the, uh, the new updates. Uh, so once that, Read happens, the update is very quick, and the write happens right fast, but uh, it takes a long time to grab those critical sections. And so you see lots and lots of blank space here. And this is only one small time slice. That was a very slow benchmark in that mode. So there are better ways. If you can, if you, can, uh, you, can you can avoid that lock contention in collective mode because the library then knows, hey, all these processes are going to write to the file concurrently. And so you might have. Um, so, so there's this thing we call two-phase collective buffering. And in phase one, there's a data exchange using the fast network. Uh, in this case, the slingshot network on Polaris is quite a bit faster than the storage. So we can, we can change data all day and uh, not all day, but we, we can move a lot of data pretty fast, faster than the storage. And so once we get the data in this format, that's really good for storage, we can write it out. Now notice server one, sorry, this, this, this OST here is seeing data from a bunch of different processes but this one process, the, the IO aggregator, is writing on behalf of everybody and, and collecting the data in a way that's good for the file system. And this is that IO transformation we were talking about earlier, where there is some data exchange happening, but in the end, uh, we didn't have a, a log of data. We put the data out in a format that uh, looks like the non-contiguous access that, that it was, even though it was written out contiguously. And if you're going to do this data transformation, you have to think about the file system that you're transferring, trans transformation, yeah, the target file system. In the old days, when we first started this process, we sort of just did, did a very simple approach where we took a, so here, we got a couple of uh, things to talk about. This top figure is the whole file. And again, these are POSIX files. So this is the first, the zeroth byte of the file, and then the last byte of the file at the end. And, and these files have a Linear structure. Any, any kind of multidimensional arrays that we picture in our head or in our programs are actually different offsets in a linear file. There's no structure to this file. And uh, the different colors here are sort of representing what each process is doing to write to the file. We have these lock boundaries on the file. So in this case, a luster, a, a, a granularity is one megabyte. EPFS, it might be 16 megabytes. Uh, if we were to just naively divide it by the IO aggregators, we have, say in this case, four, 
you'll often end up in spots where they where two aggregators are sharing one lock boundary. We have the same contention issue that we had with uh, the data seeding example. So a simple fix is just to make a little adjustment to, to uh, block a line of those, uh, those aggregator responsibilities. That helps a lot on GPFS. It's a huge improvement. On Luster, that doesn't help at all. Luster's lock strategy is a little bit different. The locks are uh, on the file, but they're, they're delegated to the Luster servers. And so we need something called a group cyclic distribution. I don't need to get the details of it, but it was complicated enough to get a paper at SC about it. And, uh, and so but the, I we just mentioned this slide so that uh, in the MPI, in the MPI library, uh, strategy one or strategy two or whatever strategy makes sense for your lower level file system is part of the MPIO knowledge. And that's a detail that you don't need to worry about as an application writer. You just make your collective IO call either directly or through MPIO and you get one of these optimizations. Pair one is appropriate. And so this is great. This helps a lot. Uh, here's our first two data points from before. I had to redo the, the Y axis because Collective I.O. for this benchmark, for this workload is, is fantastic. Now, not always fantastic, we'll figure out why, but uh, in this case, it's great. Uh, uh, what is this, uh, you know, 10,000 times faster, 1,000 times faster, I don't know. And if you look at the Darshan statistics, same number of MPIO calls, uh, turns into a much smaller number of POSIX writes, uh, and the total number, of, the total amount of data transferred is, is much smaller. And so these, uh, these pod rights are, are more naturally aligned to Luster file system. You know, that, that sawtooth curve we showed earlier, they're going to be hitting that sweet spot of the performance curve. There's fewer of them. So uh, everything wins out here. Now, uh, I'm sure you're wondering about this error bar here. We have uh, the minimum and the maximum. And this first error bar is, is terrible. Uh, this first data point, the, the slowest data point here is awful. And I didn't know why that was for a long time. Uh, and it really made the story annoying because I couldn't just tell people, use collective IO, it's gonna be perfect. And uh, further complicating this is even though I work on MPIO at Argon uh, as part of the MP the MPI, the MPH MPI library, our friends at Cray have taken the MPH library and made it their they're Cray and Pitch, and they don't share source code with us. They're, they don't have to. The license is uh, one of those MIT style do what you want with code um, licenses. But it means I don't know what they did to change this. I don't know where that came from. Uh, turns out we have an okay relationship with, with Cray. And, and so I started complaining to them about this, um, maybe not as constructively initially as I should have. Uh, uh, but I got their attention, let's say. And we, uh, Spent the, this last week, this last past five days, trying to figure out this part because I wanted to have a better story for Collective I.O. Turns out there's one environment variable that um, we can tune things a bit differently in the Cray MPI library. And uh, this is a, a, a artifact, I guess, of Slingshot 10. Uh, I don't know. Uh, with this environment variable, all processes connect to each other at startup, uh, at MPI init, I guess. And what was happening before this first error, this first very poor performance error bar, if you, if you turn this into the time domain, this would be about 35 or 45 seconds of, of just doing nothing. Uh, I'm not sure what it was trying to do, but it was, what it was trying to do, it turned out was uh, those processes, these uh, uh, what is it, 60, 20 processes, times 64, these, these 10,000 processes, we're all talking to each other, or making um, kind of like slingshot connections to each other. And it was taking a long, really long time for some reason. And so instead of spending 45 seconds to start up, we spent a much smaller time uh, by connecting to at the beginning, sorry, instead of connecting on demand in the bad case, uh, by changing the startup mode to be at the, to connect at the beginning, the collective IO performance is much better. The, the, the two phase collective buffering, the, the exchange of data that happens uh, very fast now. Uh, much tighter error, bar, error bars, and if I were to loop this a little bit further, uh, this is this is like three hour old data now. I, I think this would, this would probably show a lot of good properties as we scale up. And who knows, there are probably some more tuning parameters dug, uh, buried in that MPI library that I should worry about. No, but the story here isn't that, hey, look, there's a million things in the intro MPI man page we should read and try to tune. Uh, the story here is, 
folks like me uh, kind of get nerd sniped on problems like this and spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the best defaults should be for these systems. And if you remember that graph of a machine, it starts off being deployed and then gets retired later on. By the time it's retired, you figure out all the best tuning knobs. And then we do the whole process over again for the next machine. But here's another thing we'll probably sneak, we'll probably sneak this into, uh, I don't know, some kind of mpitch version or, or documentation somewhere so that nobody else has to pay this uh, curiosity cost anymore. Uh, this is just the kind of thing that shouldn't be part of your notes. It's more of part of the facilities notes. We'll get it wrapped up into the environment and we'll make sure everyone benefits from this kind of study. It's all, it becomes partly our jobs if we're early science project, which I've been a few times. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, now, have you checked whether this is not a problem with slingshot? Everything is now slingshot at 11, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I could not reproduce this, um, this, this first, this slow first touch problem on Frontier, for example, which is all slingshot 11. Uh, Pro motor is also all slingshot 11, I believe now. Not initially. Yeah, they're changing, right? So, yeah, but by now it's all alive. Um, so, I, well, well, this, uh, so yeah. So, early scientists come in here. They'll try to do things that I tell them to do, like, "Hey, use collective I/O." They'll say, "This is terrible. I got bad performance. Why are you telling me this stuff?" And then we then, then we sometimes figure out, "Well, okay, well, okay." Turns out here's this little doodad buried in the library stack. If we can get this enabled by default or turned off. It's all, you know, whatever the right opposite answer, answer is. And then we can get better awesome. stories yeah. from Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We did, if we took that, that same benchmark and did the DXT Explorer for it, uh, you see, uh, again, so this is, this is not zoomed in. This is the whole, because it's, it's two seconds here uh, of IO. And, uh, uh, oh, yeah, because. Uh, we have this unusual gap here. Okay, that, that's that unusual gap. We can we now understand this this first where nothing happens here. We don't understand what's happening here now. So that, you can imagine this being even smaller. And then we have these phases of, of IO. There's a there's a this this two phase collective buffering uses an internal buffer, and to not steal too much memory from the applications, it's broken up into these um, rounds of IO. And each one of these is about 16 megabytes. You could increase that internal value and make fewer rounds, and you probably see a little bit better performance. But um, 16 is at least soft enough performance for 16 that's not terrible. And um, there are this is, this is 196 ranks, but only some of them are doing I/O. 160 of them are doing I/O. Here's some blank lines from processes that are not I/O aggregators. They are uh, um, they're they're just uh, Part of the impact communicator, but they're not talking to the process. They're deferring. They're they're sending their I/O to other processes and uh, getting out of the way. And that benefits two ways: uh, the file systems see fewer clients and fewer I/O operations, which makes the the file system, generally makes the file systems happier. And it also means that um, there are there are fewer system calls being made in general. Um, so this is. Uh, I asked Kashik to come here so I could talk about some tuning parameters. Uh, we mentioned the info object. And I would say that for almost every user, the info object is less important than actually using collective IO in the first place. But uh, the info object is a, is a useful way for us to try out different parameters or strategies inside the library. And then that can help us suggest better defaults or better initial experiences. So for example, if you were to look at all the hints that are, oh, that's it. And the other thing is, uh, these info keys are strings, and you can pass anything you want in these strings. You can Mickey Mouse or Tooth Fairy. The library will ignore anything it doesn't understand. And um, these are also hints, so they're not contracts. Uh, you can pass any value you, you like, and the library can say, well, that's nice of you to suggest that, but I'm going to stick with the default that I know works here, for example. Uh, so, but anyway, so some useful things that might be you're going to try to optimize every bit of your I.O. You might play around with CB buffer size. This is a collective buffering intermediate buffer. And if you knew you had extra live memory to spare, you might make this a little bit larger, maybe factor of four or maybe even, even bigger. And that would create fewer of those iterations and you'd probably see a, a few percentage increase in performance. Um, 
here's the I mentioned I mentioned uh, kind of offhand that if we start off writing collective I/O, we can turn on the optimization. Or sorry, we can turn off the optimizations and then behave like independent I/O. This CB read and C Romeo CB read and CB write hints uh, will will take a collective I/O call and then either you know, set just fall back through into uh, independent mode if you want. So if for some reason you know that collective I/O, if you, you suspect that collective I/O is performing poorly. You can just pass this hint and not change any code, and you can try out the independent path uh, pretty easily. Um, there's a hint called there's, a, there's an optimization called deferred open. If you have a small amount of I/O per process, but you have lots of processes opening the file, you can imagine a file system being overwhelmed by ten thousand clients trying to open a file or create a file. This deferred open makes sure only the people doing I/O does I/O, and it is a uh, it sometimes doesn't work so well on Cray. Uh, so I, I don't usually come back to this one, but there are a few cases where, at high, so especially in strong scaling experiments where you have a fixed amount of data and you, you scale the number of processes and you write less and less of data per process, sometimes the open cost can be a significant piece of overhead if you're getting down to a few bytes per process. Uh, Cray has some hints that they, for their, their modifications, there's something called the, the write lock mode. And we talked about some contention in the file system. Turns out there is a way to tell the Luster file system. Uh, well, let's uh, stop pretty soon here. Uh, there's a way to tell so here, Here's my access pattern. Give me uh, not the whole file, but just this pattern of file. And if you do that, the man pages say you should, you should try this multiplier value out. Uh, I don't have a lot of fresh, I have, I have a data, I have an experiment in the queue that didn't run in time to tell you the effect of different values for this, but uh, the man page says two, I don't know, I didn't see a great benefit from that, so I'm trying smaller or larger values to see what happens there, but um, this URL here uh, is a, one of Cray's, it's about 24 pages long and there's lots of different things you can tune, both at the communication level of MPI and at the IO level of, of MPIO. All right. Uh, that went a lot longer than I thought it would. Uh, I'll be happy to talk more about MPIO, or uh, we can go right into either parallel SCDF or HDF5. It sounds like it's an HDF5 group, so I will jump over the parallel SCDF parts. All right. Um, there. So, uh, yes, if, this, if people ever here, everyone here has used HDF5, we can just talk more about it. What it does, it, you know, it's a cartoon. Uh, it's a it's a file system in a file, and the H and HDF5 stands for hier hierarchical. It's a way of organizing your data, and and it's it's portable and self-describing. So uh, you can give an HDF5 file to somebody, and they can figure out what's in there without having to bug you about what your data structures are or what format this file was created on or platform. There's a couple of concepts that I always get tripped up with in HDF5, the concept of uh, data spaces and data types and data sets. And I'm trying to figure out some way to memorize all that after all these years, but I always trip over it. Uh, but the attributes are fun too, because it's a way of putting descriptive data on the file. And so now you can have a little bit, not only is the data structured with you know, it's a, it's a five by 10 by a million array of floating point values, but you can also describe them experiment that it came from, the date that it was generated, or whatever else, what other kind of provenance I want to capture. So here again, me trying to understand data sets and data spaces. Um, we'll get into the hands-on part better. Um, you know, the, uh, all right, this is a parallel HDF5. Uh, we often butt heads with the HDF5 folks because they started off as a serial uh, data library, the HDF4 project, and then finally HDF5. And then they added parallel routines to this existing library. And so some of this stuff is done through uh, hyperslab selections or property lists or other ways that kind of um, kind of sneak the features in through the same API. And I would like to see a little more explicitly describe this stuff. But anyway, when you are talking about subsets of the data sets, we've got set up a, a, a hyperslab selection. I'll use HDF5, I'm sure you've done something like that already. 
And so the, uh, even though there are 300 some routines in the API, you can get pretty far with this basic list. You create a file, you create a memory data space, you create a data set in the file, select a subset of it, write it out, and then close everything up. And that, that's, that, you know, that some, some variation of this is in every HDF5 using program. I wrote a little, um, little HDF5 program in our repository here, and you know, it's called uh, H5, H5 par comparison.c. Uh, but all the same, right? We're using MPI here, so you got to initialize MPI and somehow send MPI down into the HDF5 library. So you just do a, a file access property list. And so when we, when we create the file, we use some flags, the, um, and then the property list is passed in as that to say, hey, when you create this file, we're going to use MPIO, and uh, we can clean up the property list now once you pass it in. Writing, uh, we have a, a memory. Uh, data set, uh, which is basically a, a one-dimensional array of, in this case, 200,000 elements, 200,000 quotes. And, uh, you know, and, and we select the entire region of that, of that memory, right? The whole, every process is gonna write some column of data out to this data set. And when I talk to MPI, I owe using, sorry, I talk to HDF5 using people, sometimes they, you know, they don't see great parallel performance, it turns out uh, often all you gotta do is turn on collective IO mode. If you don't, then you just get uh, independent access from all these rights. And so um, there have been ALC workshops where I just we just added one line to the purpose code. Oh, hey, it's worked great. It's written out in um, So don't forget this. And when we write the data set, we are associating the, the memory, this, this piece of memory, with this uh, location and file. Uh, we have used the, uh, the in, in terms of HDF5, right? We're not talking about offsets in file, we're talking about counts of uh, elements of an array. So uh, everyone, rank, rank zero writes here and rank N writes to this column, and they're all gonna write out some large number of, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's X by, uh, it's, uh, it's Y by X. So uh, 20,000 by, by one element arrays. So we have a, a memory description, a file description, a transfer optimization doodad, and a buffer of memory that tells us what kind of data we're writing out. And then blam, we do that. Now there's different ways to do that. Uh, if we do it independently, that simple operation turns into you know, 4 million MPI IO operations, 4 million MPI, MPI IO operations, which turn into 4 million deposits operations, and we get really poor performance. Uh, okay, in this benchmark, we're writing out the array and reading it back. So we have, we have a mixture of writes and reads. If we use collective I.O., hey, we, we've cut the number of operations down by many orders of magnitude. And you can imagine the you know, overall I.O. is it's much larger, more cost friendly. Uh, but there's still a good number of, of reads happening here. What, what's going on here? Well, the HDF5 file has structure. It has a uh, it's a file system in the file, so just like a file system, it has a B tree and, and structure indexes and things like that. So there's some there's some stuff going on here. There's a new a newish optimization called collective metadata that uh, can have those those updates happen from one process and send the results to everybody else. And so now instead of having every every HDF5 reader and writer try to understand the structure of the file, only a one or maybe a small number of processes do and sends the information out to everybody else. And we've again gotten better performance. Now, in this case, we're running out uh, uh, about a megabyte of data per process. So these extra metadata operations aren't really significant at this scale, but you can imagine uh, at larger number of processes, these small operations might end up eating into your runtime uh, in, in ways that you might not really appreciate. Uh, again, for Luster, uh, I'm not sure what the right number of scale. At what point we start feeling that pain? But this collective metadata operation has, has proven itself pretty useful at the larger scales. Uh, it doesn't seem like a few hundred operations of, of 500 bytes or so would be a big deal, but you can have spending several minutes, tens of minutes, just getting that data through uh, because everybody, every process is doing the same thing. Uh, too, too redundant. 
And uh, I mentioned Darshan, and Darshan has this, this tool called a heat map. And uh, we can spend a little time talking about this because this it's is a newer feature in Darshan. It's really helpful. The, uh, this is kind of like a, 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 I don't know, a crazy histogram where there's one histogram of time, uh, in this case, 145 bids in the histogram. And so you can sort of see at each time, at each one of these slices, how much IO is happening somewhere. And at which level, the MPIO level or the Plotix level. And again, look independent for some time. And then uh, each row of this histogram is a rank. So everybody in this case is making MPIO calls. Here's the right part, here's the read part. You have a, a kind of a, up here, you've got a measure of how intensive the IO is, both in terms of time, and over on this column, how intensive in terms of rank. All right, that's a lot of ground, ground work here. But what this is telling me is all these MPI process, every, every process is making MPI calls. When we do independent writes to HDF5, there's no transformation that happens. It just goes right straight through to the POSIX layer. Everybody's doing writes. It's all kind of the same intensity and the colors are about the same. And it's, it's gonna be, pretty, it's, and we, as you can see, it's, it's 400 some seconds. So pretty slow. When we draw on collective, Collective metadata and collective I.O. Uh, okay, so first off, we have this big, slow, long delay here. I know that is now, right? That's that, that right off the presses, not ambiguous data. The first touch of the file, of the file causes this wire up delay. And so um, that was that was 30 seconds. Okay, now I know I make this even smaller. So instead of 30 seconds in the collective I.O. case, it'll probably be five seconds. But when we get to the actual I.O. phase, um, both writing and reading, only a small number of processes are involved. They're, um, you know, you can see the IO aggregators are the ones doing the writes and the reads, and uh, performance is really good. And so, uh, this, the, moral, so the moral of this story is uh, there's a couple of things that you don't get by default in HDF5, but if you can turn on those property list optimizations, the collective IO, the collective metadata, collective oper uh, collective metadata writes and collect the metadata reads and use MPIO, uh, you're, you're unlocking all those optimizations we spent you know, an hour and a half talking about. Uh, I am not a, oh, yes, sorry. go ahead. So, site PH, um, so okay. when we started this project, you were explaining about uh, MPIO two-phase IO data saving. Now we come to HDF5. Yeah. Uh, how do I pass those pins? The CP node, CP aggregate. Oh yeah, great. All this stuff to the five now. Um, I would say uh, if you had, if you really had to. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I think I. Heard when we when we tell HDF five this property list, hey, use an MPI communicator. We also get an info object we can pass in. We I passed in null here, but you can create an info object, set up those keys and values, and, and pass it here as you were about to create or open the HDF five file. On some implementations like Cray, there are special environment variables you can set to pass in hints as well. Um, I didn't talk about that too much, but that's also documented in their intro MPI page. But but programmatically, this is this is where info objects are, are connected or wired up into the HDF5 library. Thanks for that's a good point. We spent so much time talking about it, and I didn't mention how to do it. HDF5, excuse me, HDF5. And and um, no, I didn't do any hints here. For these examples, yeah. So, how many aggregators will it use? Uh, 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 in this case, it was 100, it was 320 processes, uh, 190, uh, 160, I think. On Polaris, the maximum stripe size is 160, 160, so yeah, 160 aggregators, one per, one per OST. If you uh, dump the hints out, there's also an environment variables to ask that, or you can query the info object. You can get back the, the CB nodes, the collective buffering nodes as a, you can also, you can set it, or you can also read it and it'll tell you how many were used. Um, and if you want to programmatically know how many aggregators were involved, it'd be one way to get it. Uh, and then I'm not a Python person, but people have had some success with H5Py to interact with uh, HDF5 files. Now, uh, I was trying to 
port my examples over to, to this one. And it turns out they don't expose some of those optimizations, the, collect, the, the, the collective metadata optimizations or some of the newer features um, yet. And you just pull requests in there. So uh, it's a it's a wrapper over the, it's a Python wrapper over the HDFI library. So it's not hard to get these HDFI features through, but sort of there's a, there's a, a process, I guess, to update the bindings. And uh, I just learned in the last year about this thing called High Five, a C++ header only interface. Uh, again, they don't, they sometimes don't expose every optimization. So I had to work with them a little bit to expose some of these collective IO um, optimizations. And once we did that, the C++ using application did a lot better. Uh, so you, you saw how verbose HDFI can be. It's hard to fit a whole HDFI program in one slice of, slice of code. So uh, these wrappers do a great job of, of making some of these explicit things implicit. And so they're uh, awfully convenient uh, in terms of programmer product, in terms of programmer productivity. They have some. Uh, as the trade-off is that they, they may not be always uh, be performance oriented, uh, but as we've seen, the, the theme here is when you run into I/O problems, you can ask folks like me, and we'll we'll fix it. Uh, in HDF5, there are new things happening. It's, it's it's an old library, but they keep doing new new things. Uh, asynchronous a, asynchrony is being added to HDF5. The idea that you can host a bunch of writes and then check on how they did later if you don't need to. You don't need to know right away that you're you're right completed or or same thing for the reads. I think uh, it's not as formal as the the futures that that are, are that Christine talked about in the workflow talk, but the same ideas are you 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 if you don't need the data immediately, you can ask HDF5 to go get in the background while you do something else and you check on it later. And I didn't have time to talk about multi data set I/O, but I love this optimization because it's uh, it turns out to be really useful in certain cases. Um, picture a, a, a scientific application that's writing out, oh, you know, 30 variables or some number of variables uh, to an HDF5 data set. Um, you could use the multi data set optimizations to tell HDF5, I'm going to write out to all these 30 variables at once. And as we've seen, any chance that you get to tell the IO libraries about all the things that are happening, uh, more context, uh, there's more opportunities to optimize. So, um, the, uh, as you know, this was only released a few months ago, but I'm looking forward to trying out more of that and seeing how it behaves. Uh, there are lots of IO libraries, so if you aren't using HDF5 for whatever reason, uh, there's other choices out there. My favorite of this one is the H5 part library, which took all 300 some API routines of HDF5 and turned it into seven. Because if you're a particle accelerator of code, you only care about opening the data set, tracking a particle, Reading a particle, closing the data set, and so that, you know that it can really tailor down to what needs to happen for that library. I didn't talk about parallel CDF too much, but that's something I worked on with my colleague at Northwestern. And if you're in the climate or weather communities, you probably use the NetCDF data set. A lot of these choices come down to communities. Uh, HDF5 is pretty popular, but there are niche communities, not niche communities, but there are communities where they have chosen other formats and sometimes the choice of which one to use comes down to that as much as performance or other features. So all the machine learning uh, apps are used mostly using HDF5 and some some part of the uh, so I'm getting called out on why to talk machine learning and the answer is I, I don't know enough about machine learning to give a, a talk about the ins and outs of it. Uh, that's an area that we're, we're looking to learn more, more about. Uh, broadly speaking, machine learning and and and, and inference models. Uh, I would say that uh, the biggest changes are are more, more reads. They're randomly um, playing on the model, uh, random random reads throughout the, the, the data set, and um, fewer uh, natural areas for this, these collective optimizations to come into play. So. Um, if we were to deploy something to optimize these kind of workloads, it would be it would look a lot it would look less like two phase collective buffering, and it would look more like an intermediate caching layer or or a smart read ahead buff, uh, or, or something that would be a little more tailored to the models that machine learning is doing. But since we don't 
uh, have a great. Uh, so that's an area we're currently working a lot on. So, uh, and I probably should have put a couple slides up at least about it. Uh, but that's uh, yeah, that's uh, one of those areas I need to learn more. So I'm uh, gonna want to play by the wrong thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and right. So I do have a bullet on machine learning, where, where we are thinking more about what we can do there to make it better. Uh, not everything's a good fit for MPI IO, uh, or, or, or even, but just as you as you observed, HDF5 is almost everywhere. So uh, when we use we think about these optimizations, we think about how we can get them into uh, an HDF5 kind of model. Maybe maybe they're used in a way that. HDF5 users don't even know what's happening. That would be, I think, highly ideal. Um, so HDF5 has a couple of different of these called the called the virtual object layer. Some uh, libraries you can link into HDF5, and then you do an HDF5 interface to a totally different way of writing out the storage and data. And one of those ways is a caching layer, the cached ball. There's an async ball. There's a, a log ball, and I think you can find. Some permutation or, or maybe some variation of that that, work, that makes sense for each other. Another ball I should talk about is, is an in situ visualization ball that, that does some of the work inside the HDF5 call. So uh, I can imagine something like that happening for uh, machine learning down the road, but right now we're, we're not there yet. Uh, so that's it for me. I did a lot more talking than I thought. Uh, we didn't really do any code writing today, but uh, we have time to talk out anything, or I appreciate your interactivity. I was convinced I'd have an empty room given the strong talks that are happening concurrently here. So thanks for stopping by, and uh, yeah, let's we can chat some more. If you have to go home uh, about about all this stuff. Oh, Christmas, yeah. I got a question for Are you aware of any HDF file formats for medical data? Uh, I am not aware of any specific uh, conventions that HDF5 is used for medical data. No, uh, I, could, I can imagine. Uh, be the, so, uh, step to step back in the NetCDF community, they, they, there are, there's no there's no wrong way to create an HDF5 or a NetCDF file. They're all valid files, but they have these things called conventions in climate and modeling and weather where. Uh, a, a file with a certain convention is going to have latitude and longitude and altitude and, and the different scientific quantities that they expect to have. So um, they can spend less time interrogating the file and just assume it has these things. I, I presume there's something similar in, in the medical field, but I, I don't know of that in the hospital. Yeah. Why, why is that, for example, in medical data, it could be multi there will be images and medical records and some, for example, time series data and these type of things. Do you think it's going to be a heterogeneous set of data of each country? That would definitely be something HDF5 could do. Uh, and it would be right up its alley uh, to have a mixture of, of very small annotations and very large uh, time series data or big images or series of images. Uh, that seems like that would be a good fit for HDF5, yeah. Uh, I, but I don't know of any specific. Something like that, HDF5 may be perfect for that kind of purpose. I think it could work, real, could work out well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in machine learning, uh, what I've observed is most of the time is spent on all radios. So with part of our uh, distributed uh, training, so after each step, all the weights, it waits for the, sorry, I mean, the weights for the weights. I mean, yeah. Got it. all the weights, the yeah. new optimized weights, and then it does one uh, all radios, and then it starts the next step with the, the new training. So is there any way that we can optimize all this, all reduce? Because uh, that's the biggest bottleneck. Uh, my, my, my first thought might be some of the newer non-blocking collectives that are happening in MPI. But since you need the results of the first round of weights before you can make 
you do need the you need the results, right? You're not just yeah. So you, I don't know. That's the challenge of of, of the challenge. Um. Because uh, right, so the, the because all because all reduce is collective, the performance, the slowness of all reduce is is going to be less moving the actual data around. It's the waiting, it's, it's the delay as slow processes or, or busy processes come into the collective. You could try the, so the non-blocking collectives might help a little bit because it could make some. It could have some process make progress while you're waiting for that last process, but I don't think it's going to be enough to move the needle there. Um, other than that, I can't think of anything that would be a silver bullet yet. Um, it, it would require some rethinking of, of, of how to spend the weighted data in two places if you could somehow. I don't know enough machine learning to know what that means even. But if you have if you have some situation where everybody has to exchange data with everybody and not everybody gets there in time, I just don't know how you can make, make things work out better yet. Uh, no, I guess you have to think of why why are some processes slower than others and what can we do to what can we do to, to redistribute the, the load or speed up the work. It's kind of general things like that. But if you know, but it's good you know what the problem is that the how to uh, identify the next step. That's the best I can do. <laughs> oh, yeah, so far. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm liking I like the H5Y um, okay. documentation. And like you know, they have, like you mentioned, they're a LACI of five implementation of some kind, which Relies on building it with MPI. Yes. Um, I can see like you provide the uh, the world to your so like you initialize like an H five pi object, a file object of some kind, uh, and you provide it. Okay. Provide it to the MPI world and. I suppose it more or less knows what to do from there. Um, fine. Fine. Yeah, just search like parallel HTML5. Oh, maybe we can just describe our problem exactly. Well, it's like, it has, it has to be the flow of the problem. Is it, is it okay if we um, like describe? Exactly what our issue is, and maybe yeah. you can point out. Okay, so we have a model that, um, given some input, um, outputs a matrix yeah. n by n, because you know, because we can, yeah. And what we do is we have like let's say we have 20,000 um inputs, right? And so we give that to different nodes of different codes and the model does its stuff it predicts the matrix and it writes each one out into an HDFI bound so we have 20,000 HDFI bound but instead of that we want to write as it predicts um, the one bit HDFI bound and my colleague has tried to implement parallel write, or he, he ran into many. That was more of a build process kind of thing, and I, I know you guys but have then, people working but, on that. But isn't the the right. parallel HDF five write on Polaris right? Uh, yeah, right. and also this is like a parcel pipeline where we really have a lot of workers. I don't know if that's right. So issue. this is also using parcel to like parallelize. Um, so, so, so we're task-oriented, right? So an MPI, but okay, yeah, all right. Um, so in that case, where you're, um, that's that is harder because um, the files, because uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, because in, uh, in that case, 
would have, you could imagine, maybe you could imagine a, a three-dimensional uh, HDF5 array and where the, the nth dimension might be, I don't know, task. And here you got all your, your matrix data. Um, in the, and so you could you tell your, you tell HDF5, hey, we're all going to write to this file all together. And, and because it's a it's a BI, HDF5 sees that coming. Okay, I can make a plan and we can, we can structure this data and we can put it all in, in one or two IO calls. In the task case, um, you can still have the same one uh, uh, one block of the array per, per per task, but this this uh, updating process. If each, if each if each task comes in and tries to update together, there's no way to coordinate them, and so you might have well, this might be like an update. Update uh, 7,625 and uh, update 129 and, and, and so on. Uh, and, and this doesn't happen at the same time, it happens as the tasks submit. So I, if I was going to, I might, I was just thinking they might do this. And maybe if you had a, I feel like that might be the, the, the parcel or, or the workload manager. The workload manager should have some facility where the tasks can report to it. Hey, I need to write this data to a, to a thing, and that guy could batch the data or cache the data or, um, or somehow uh, put it in like an IE queue or something. Because yeah, some kind of queue, or uh, I can imagine all kinds of fun things you do with that. Uh, because if, if every process comes through it independently, it's going to have to. You're gonna to have to acquire some block on the because all this happens inside. There is like a lock, right? It doesn't natively you can't just have multiple processes, right? Yeah, you, well you can certainly I, I don't think there is, unfortunately. I think if you uh, have all these processes independently open a file and write to it and then close the file, there'd probably be a good chance of corruption. There's a right. thing called yeah. a single writer, multiple reader, a swimmer mode. But that is more like uh, here's a device that is here's a device that's spitting out data to your HDF5 file um, block by block. That's a time, time step zero, one, and so on. And then everyone else is pulling data from the HDF5 file as it shows up. These the readers. Yeah. But you have the opposite, where you are having lots of writers creating the file and, and maybe a few readers. I think the readers just did something until later on. Yeah. Um, I, feel like this, I feel like someone should have tackled this already, but if I was going to just think off the top of my head, I would probably yeah have a have, a, have something else uh, listening for these reads and writes. And I mean, great. The other thing you do the, the, as you did the pragmatic thing, One dot HDF five. Oh, terrible, terrible handwriting. Um, magnetic. Okay. The other approach could be uh, just a bunch of separate one dot H and two dot H five. Two dot H five. And and then that, that would be fine. You'd end up with a bunch of as you say a bunch of files. Then um, this would be step one, and then step two, uh, something reads them all in, and then recreates a single file. You might. Take all this and then create that one file with with with, with the multi-dimensional uh, output, where where all the data in each plane of this array is one of these files, or something, whatever makes sense for your 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 consumers. This 
this step might not be so long actually. Um, and, and on balance, the this this creation would be sort of fast, and re reading it all in might be. Well, I don't I don't know how to say for sure, but it, it might not be as it might not be it might, not, it might I wouldn't necessarily rule out a, a post processing uh, conversion step if that makes if that's easier to do than um, writing a service a caching listening service that writes the data out in the first place. You got a couple of approaches. Um, I've got swimmer. That's not what's going on here. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about, because it's not super related, is this. Uh, work on this the IO services. So instead of writing file systems and libraries, trying to write little microservices. For processes that do things kind of like this, where uh, they can send the data, where, where data exchange and, and, and IO are sort of building blocks that we can then work with domains. And, and so this might be a, a situation uh, where we could write a little service that would do this kind of thing, where each process would be a client of the service, they would send the data over, the service would be responsible for creating a a, a well format, a single well formatted file. And that service could itself be parallel if you needed to have more concurrency uh, in the writes across multiple nodes or like right. more nodes. Kind of it's on MPI, like it would be kind of, uh, right, yeah, sort of my head is always wired, I think in terms of MPI. Uh, but you could imagine you could imagine an MP, a longer running process that the MPI writes and reads the file like that. Well the post post processing is definitely I already have done that. It's kind of our like basic solution. But it, it gives a limits the number of the size of the run you can do at a time depending on the system. Yeah you wouldn't want to try to reread the first file. So if that's the case, then yeah, it's kind of yeah. kind of monitor or, or or data service that your workflow could could log data at you know, the intermediary between the file system and the, and, uh, and the tasks. Um, so yeah, I, I just don't have enough workflow experiences to know how that would how hard that would be. So do you see you like, see like Message you if no, oh, always, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, my name, my ID line is on the first slide. It's, it's our latest, it's Rob L at NFCS. And uh, no, so you're with parcel, that's your workflow, or is yeah, it like parcel? It is parcel, okay. Yeah, we have like this inference, you know, we have a train model, and the inference portion is, is implemented in parcel because we maybe like, I guess, the, you know, it's a machine learning thing, but in our case, we actually. We're actually, at least currently, it's the inference that's much larger. Yeah, like this yeah, yeah. much more right for us than read at the thumb. Um, but yeah, like training the really big models is like more read. It just yeah. depends on the case. I thought I should, thought I should talk to the parcel folks to have something like that already. But, um, yeah. Or give them more time for not having something. Yeah. So you have like an MPI. Executor, yeah, which makes me think that there's probably like some kind of like global MPI somewhere, yeah, somewhere <laughs> that right. could be used here. Is that, is that correct? I'm not like MPI is kind of new. That, sure, that, sure. That means yeah. I and yeah, when I hear like when I hear executor, I don't, I don't know if that would be the right thing or not, but. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of abstraction and that's all that. Yeah. Um, I can look into that. Yeah. These things are starting to like make more sense, so I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, though, no, uh, 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 so we sort of got our hands around, our heads around simulation IO just in time for the whole world to change and move to, to <laughs> tasks and, and, and workflows and, um, and, and different programming models. 
think that's a plus. Something else I can do is instead of writing single HTML5 files, which are written in that for loop because there's a for loop that takes each of the um, each of the input in a batch. So we give a batch right one parcel up, right? And then it does a for loop. So maybe we could write all of those things in that batch into one HDF file. So if we give a batch of like, if you have like 20,000 inputs, sequences, and we batch, say a hundred. So it's like a writing query for the problem. Yes, yes, yes. So it is just going to be like, instead of writing 20,000 HDFI files, it's going to write a hundred HDFI files, each one corresponding to each batch. Because writing, oh, like within the yeah, process, yes, yes. Within so the, within the, the job process, right? Yeah, and then we yeah, can then awesome. afterwards do um, the post processing. But then we won't. So that way we won't have twenty thousand files. We'd have like a hundred or a number of batches. Yeah, that'd be improvement. That'd probably solve it. Yeah, I don't know how easy. So you have to. We have to modify. I can I can modify it. I just have to look. You have code to like open each like each parcel up basically. Each parcel up process yeah. and it gets a subset of the data. Right. And it writes that subset into one HDF file. Yeah, that's a problem. And then that way you can customize it such that if you are able to use the give the entire twenty thousand at once, I don't know when you'll be able to do that. But that will write just one HDFI file for you for all your input. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So instead of like a batch, you know, normally you'd split you you'd split the twenty thousand into like batches. Instead of giving a batch, you just give it the entire twenty thousand as one batch. You could oh, like one data, one yes, matrix. Right. Right. Well, I mean so that's I like the imminent solution, I think. That way we will generate. Yeah. Is it bad to have a lot of data set, individual data sets in any given HDF5 file? Or like, because like basically we could, we could store our data as a big table, have some kind of lookup, separate lookup, from like, you know, no, routine. I, I prefer, but it's all, I prefer having you can just I prefer think of like the key exactly. in your head, and just any because program. The keys look it up. Are the, at the regions, chromosome one, position five to ten. Right. That's going to be like, like, individual, individual. like you can. So you're annoying to have a lookup table that everyone no, has to use. Lookup tables. Are, I don't. I don't. I don't have that. I don't know of any restrictions in HDF five about about data sets. It'll be harder to get parallel performance across data sets unless you use this multi data set operation. But if your main concern is just how to keep track, how to manage a bunch of tiny files versus one container of those files. Four thirty. So we can every certainly conventions. I'd say that, yeah, I'd say your first step could very well be one data set or one HDFI variable per per task, and then you can think about different ways to structure that data. Depending on your consumers, I mean, I can imagine a couple of different ways, like time series or a spatial series or like whatever makes sense for uh, the, the next step. Of that. But anyway, good thing. I should take a picture of this and show it to the hacky. Oh, uh, it's not so hacky. Is is our PI? All right. So, and she's supposed to be here, but she had somewhere else to be. If you wanted us to come learn about HDF5 files and how to solve our problems.